Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, January 25th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the winner of the Make Fun of Hillary contest. And would you want this man to be your next president? In the spirit of gun control, will you disarm your entire security team? Uh, you will think, get right back to you. You'll get back to me? Would you like a sip of my soda? Mayor Michael Bloomberg threatens to throw his hat in the ring. That's next. We've got the jump on you, we know what you're up to, and we're fully aware of your garbage. Now you thought you just poisoned us with fluoride and vaccines and stun us and then we can still take us over. You, you, you are falling, you are rotting, you are ugly, you are stupid, you are bad, you are pathetic, you will fail. drinking water. You can't survive without it. But where do you get it? Alexa Pure Pro is a brand new groundbreaking gravity-fed water filtration system that is like no other. The Alexa Pure Pro transforms water from virtually any fresh source into clean, healthy drinking water, pairing the unprecedented super filtration power of an all-new gravity block core with a hybrid chromatic shell. It removes up to 99.999% of impurities, including bacteria, viruses, fluoride, disinfectants, volatile organic contaminants, and hormones. Filter capacity up to 5,000 gallons, stainless steel construction, easy assembly, low maintenance, replacement filters are simple to install. And now, as part of an exclusive limited time introductory offer, you can save $20 off the retail price and get free shipping. This is a limited time offer, so order your unit today and receive free shipping and $20 off. Go to InfoWarsStore.com or call 888-253-3139. There was a lot of buzz this weekend about Michael Bloomberg possibly entering to the presidential race as an independent. I want to take a look at this and ask, what does his entry tell us about a couple of things? Number one, about the global elitist cabal that we've just seen uh, meeting in Davos. Also, what does it tell us about our corrupt, gamed system? Why is he getting in? Well, first of all, he says he would get in if Hillary Clinton doesn't make it. They're concerned that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump don't take orders from this globalist elite cabal that we see in Davos. And so they want to make sure that they've got somebody, typically they like to have both candidates be someone that they've met with previously, that they have an understanding with before the election that will do their bidding. They always uh, can try to do that after the election. We always have to be concerned that our candidates will cave into that, uh, not be their own man, not operate in the interest of the American people. But they want to make sure there's somebody there ahead of time. That tells us something about Hillary Clinton, doesn't it? It tells us that Hillary Clinton is their woman, the one they would like to have and the one that they feel comfortable that they can control things with. If Hillary Clinton uh, doesn't make it in the primaries, if she's indicted for criminal actions, as she should be, then we have Michael Bloomberg waiting in the wings. And we're going to take a look at what it would take for him to be an independent candidate and how they have rigged that process as well. But first, let's take a quick look at Davos. It just wrapped up. And as we see on RT, the headlines is Davos is the problem and not the solution. They talk about the fact that we have problems of mass unemployment, an ever-widening gap between rich and poor, the biggest refugee crisis since World War II. Where does that come from? It comes from the very people who are meeting at Davos. As one person tweeted out, Harry Leslie Smith, quoted in this article, says, The world is in a bad way, from wars, a global refugee crisis, to economic mayhem. But no one at the Davos 2016 apologized for their leadership over it. And they go on to point out the World Economic Forum says it is committed to improving the state of the world, but the reality is, is that the world is in much worse shape than it was when it was created in 1971. They like to talk about stakeholder theory, global public interest, and it really is an elite-friendly economic order. Think about the fact they talk about stakeholders all the time. Whenever you see them talking about stakeholders, whether they're talking about it with climate treaties or whether they're talking about it with trade treaties, is always the stakeholders who are the ones who are meeting in the private rooms, creating the documents, and then handing it off to the so-called elected representatives of us uh, to rubber stamp and enact. It's those stakeholders that put everything together because they don't believe that you and I have a stake in the future. And if we don't understand what's going on, we won't have a stake in the future. It'll be people 
at Davos, people like uh, George Soros, people like uh, Bill Gates, Tony Blair, and of course, Eric Cantor. Eric Cantor, you know, the guy who was primaried out because of the way he sold out the Republican Party. He lost the primary. He was the number two guy in the House, second only to Boehner. And he lost his primary. That was pretty much unprecedented. It was uh, something that hadn't happened uh, for, I think it was uh, well over 100 years. Nevertheless, he's at uh, Davos talking about the consequences of Donald Trump. We covered this article last week. It was from Bloomberg Business, interestingly enough. The headline was, The Specter of Donald Trump Haunts Davos. And they say Trump and the White House is ratcheting up anxiety among the 2,500 business and political leaders gathered at the Swiss ski resort for the annual World Economic Forum. And then they quote Eric Cantor, who says, Unfortunately, I do think that if there were to be a Trump administration, the casualty would likely be trade. You see, they want to push through the Trans-Pacific Transatlantic Partnership Agreements because creating this trade block is the necessary step for them to create a political uh, consolidation. And so that's what they're concerned about. And again, it's not to say that uh, I don't support Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. It's not to say that they're good guys. They're the enemy of my enemy. So you could say that we could support them for that reason. Nevertheless, they are very concerned that these people are not going to toe the line, not going to do precisely what they want in terms of open borders, in terms of exporting our jobs, in terms of destroying the country economically. And that's what Donald Trump has risen up to oppose. Now, Bloomberg, they say, sensing, sensing an opening, revisits a potential White House run. This is the story that came out this last weekend. They say his advisors and associates say that he was galled by Donald Trump's dominance in the Republican field, troubled by Hillary Clinton's stumbles, and by the rise of Senator Bernie Sanders on the Democrat side. They say uh, Bloomberg, who's 73, has indicated to friends and allies that he'd be willing to spend at least a billion dollars of his fortune on it. He's retained a consultant to help him explore getting his name on the ballots. And his aides have done a detailed study of past third-party bids. And we're going to take a look at some past third-party bids. What does it take to get into the debates? Uh, what does it take to, uh, how did they game the system? But before we do, quickly, uh, what, what Hillary is saying, as she, her reaction to it was, uh, well, I've got it covered. Uh, they say that uh, he only says he's going to consider running if Hillary Clinton doesn't make the cut. This is what she had to say. And Michael Bloomberg, your reaction to his uh, potential candidacy? Um, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, I'm going to do the best I can to make sure that uh, I get the nomination, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so you're not worried about him getting in? Well, the way I read what he said is if I didn't get the nomination, he might consider it. Well, I'm going to relieve him of that and get the nomination so he doesn't have to. And, of course, he has set a March deadline to determine whether or not he's going to jump in. Why March? Well, we have the Iowa, the New Hampshire, and the South Carolina primaries and caucuses. Then we have Super Tuesday, the very beginning of March. By that time, it'll be clear whether or not Hillary is losing to Bernie Sanders. It'll also be clearer whether or not she's going to be indicted for her crimes or not. When we look at the uh, process of getting on the ballot as an independent, that also plays into this. The earliest possible uh, state that he has to uh, make ballot access would be South Dakota, not a large state. Uh, that is the end of April. He would have to get signatures through to that. But if you look at the requirement and the timing for this, most of the states have a deadline that falls in August and September. So he can get in quite late and uh, still get into most of those. But let's take a look at whether or not the debates unfairly shut out third parties. Because as we see this talk of uh, Michael Bloomberg getting in, preceding that, we saw a lot of chatter about how the debate commission was going to take a look at a serious independent candidate being included in the debates. And that would be uh, pretty much unprecedented for a couple of decades. The last candidate that we had that was included, of course, was Ross Perot in 1992. He was excluded in 1996 when he ran the second time because of the rules of the Presidential Debate Commission. So let's take a look at this. This is an article going back to 2012. And of course, we look at this every time uh, this comes up because it is glaringly unfair the way they control the debate process. As they point out, CBS says the presidential and vice presidential debates are sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. It is a nonprofit corporation that mandates that a candidate have at least 15 percent. Remember that 15 percent support in national polls to participate. Since this uh, Commission on Presidential Debates took over running the debates in 1988, only once 
has a third party candidate been allowed to participate in 1992 when Ross Perot joined Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush on the stage? It looks like it's doing what it was designed to do and it does it very well. It keeps everybody off except for the Republicans and the Democrats. And of course, if you go back and look at the history of this, you see that it was John Anderson who gave everybody a scare in 1980. We'll take a look at that in just a moment. Uh, the author of a book called No Debate, How the Republican and Democrat Parties Secretly Control the Presidential Debates, that's uh, George Farrell who wrote that, said that um, the 15% criteria is absurdly high. Of course it is. Uh, noting that candidates who reach 5% support qualify for public funding if they reach that in past elections. Think about that. The government says, we will give you support because you're a serious candidate if you get to 5%. And yet the debate commission says you have to get to 15%. And he points out third parties have played a vital role in the past in our histories. Of course, we had three parties up until the Civil War. After the Civil War, they shut that down. They made sure that no other third party would come in. They set up a duopoly. Actually, it was really a monopoly by the Republican Party for many, many decades. No Democrats got elected. And when you look at the history of presidential debates, of course, there was the famous one with uh, John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon in 1960. Interestingly enough, there wasn't another one until 1976, and that was um, held by the League of Women Voters. They pretty much were, I think, a lot fair in terms of their inclusion. In the 1980 uh, presidential race, of course, that was Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and John Anderson was the independent. Uh, Jimmy Carter strongly opposed the inclusion of independent candidate John Anderson. Anderson had polled as high as 26%, but of course, Jimmy Carter didn't want him on simply because of that, because he had high support. And so what he did was he boycotted the debate by the League of Women Voters, leaving John Anderson to debate Ronald Reagan by himself. In 1984, uh, as Reagan was running for re-election, the League of Women Voters held a press conference. They lambasted Reagan and Walter Mondale, the Democrat running against him at that point in time, for rejecting dozens of potential debate moderators. And then after that, the Republicans and Democrats said, this is enough. We're not going to have anything like the League of Women Voters running this. We're going to run it ourselves. And so they set up this commission, and they justify it with the crowded ballot fallacy. This is a Newton Minnow, a great name for somebody, <laughs> a small fish in a uh, big pond. A member of the CPD, former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, he said that this threshold keeps the debates from becoming a free-for-all. He said, there are 410 candidates, let me repeat that, 410 candidates that are registered with the Federal Election Commission. No, look, the crowded ballot would not happen. Simply put, if you look at all of the candidates in the last election who qualified, who are mathematically uh, capable because they were on enough ballots of winning the presidency, you would have had not 410, but four. You would have also included Gary Johnson and uh, the Green candidate uh, party. Uh, you would have had four candidates there in addition to Barack Obama and, um, uh, what was that guy's name? <laughs> oh, that guy, uh, Romney. That was his name, right? That's all you would have had in the last debate. As a matter of fact, they point out that it would not have been that crowded. If you had taken a look at people who had, if he made it a little bit narrow and said 5% support, you would have had Ross Perot would have participated in the debates in 1996 as well as 1992. He's excluded. You would have had Ralph Nader and Pat Buchanan in 2000. And that's basically it. Why can't we have that kind of a choice? Well, we can't have that kind of a choice because the political establishment and the media establishment collude together to shut that down. Look at this article from The Atlantic. Just consider the headline, Fox Business Winnows the Field. This was for the debate that was held in December. Fox Business Winnows the Field. Why should they be allowed to winnow the field? And of course, if we look at the qualifications that they had to be included in the debate, they're far less than 15%. They looked at four national polls. Any candidate who averaged just 2.5% or higher made the primetime cut. CNN's debate two weeks earlier allowed for candidates who polled 3.5% or higher, or 4% or higher in Iowa and, or New Hampshire. Look, we have an interest in knowing who these people are. We should have a free and open discussion. We shouldn't allow Fox news to determine how many candidates we're going to have in the debate. We shouldn't allow the Republicans and the Democrats to shut everybody else out of the debate. 